Oxygen truly changes everything. Oxygen affects the rate and type of terrestrial weathering, and in turn the structure and productivity of the ocean. One major change is in the redistribution of nutrients in the ocean. Rapidly sinking eukaryotes set up something called the carbon pump. Most organic matter produced in the plankton is remineralized. Remineralization is the breakdown of cells and other organic material into their constituent organic molecules and dissolved nutrients by microbes. This cycle of cell growth and production and subsequent destruction back into the constituent compounds is called the microbial food loop and involves diverse types of bacteria and eukaryotic cells recycling every organic thing in the ocean's water column. Today, only about 1-2% to 2 of organic matter made in the surface ocean reaches the sea floor, and even less is buried permanently there. Some organic matter escapes from the surface ocean and the microbial food loop and carries nutrients like iron, phosphorus, and molybdenum, as well as various other metals, carbon dioxide and carbon-12, into the deep ocean. When that organic matter is remineralized near the ocean floor, the nutrients, carbon dioxide, and carbon-12 are all liberated, enriching the deep ocean water in this stuff. This process of fixation of carbon in the surface ocean, mostly via photosynthesis, and its remineralization in the deep ocean is called the carbon pump, since carbon is literally transported into the ocean uh, interior by this process. The carbon pump sets up gradients in nutrients, CO2, and carbon-12 in the ocean, making these things rare in the surface water and enriched in the deep sea. The oxygenation of the atmosphere and surface ocean affects the distribution of nutrients in the ocean, and hence the productivity of marine plankton. For instance, both iron and phosphorus become less abundant in an oxic ocean. As the ocean becomes more oxygenated, dissolved iron is removed by formation of insoluble iron oxides. Hence, iron becomes rare in the surface water and becomes a micronutrient for algae. The same thing happened with phosphorus, which forms an insoluble oxide called phosphate when exposed to air. So today, phosphorus is also a micronutrient like iron. On the other hand, some nutrients become more abundant in an oxic ocean. Sulfate and molybdenum oxides both become enriched in an oxic ocean since both are released by weathering of sulfides on land, and both are soluble in oxygenated seawater. Notably, in a hypoxic ocean, such as probably existed through most of the Precambrian, both iron and phosphorus exist in dissolved forms, while molybdenum and sulfate are both precipitated out of the ocean as sulfides. A key realization is that once the atmosphere starts to accumulate free oxygen, the surface ocean becomes oxygenated to some degree. Hence, this oxic surface layer will tend to have little dissolved iron and phosphorus, since both form insoluble compounds there, whereas molybdenum and sulfate will be abundant. Just the opposite is true at depth, because where the oxygen runs out, iron and, and phosphorus both become soluble again, and molybdenum and sulfate are rare. The crossover point between an oxic surface ocean and a hypoxic or anoxic deep ocean is called the chemocline. Now, the Proterozoic Ocean, around 2.5 billion years ago, had a strong, shallow chemocline, which was ideal for the production of organic matter. The chemocline had everything a microbe could want. There was oxygen just above the chemocline and no oxygen just below, suitable for both aerobic and anaerobic respiration by different microbial groups. There was abundant molybdenum used in photosynthesis and sulfate above the chemocline and lots of iron and phosphorus just below. In addition, any organic matter made at the chemocline or just above it quickly became hard to digest as it sank into the hypoxic water just below the chemocline because all the microbes eating that marine snow were now using inefficient anaerobic metabolisms. Hence, there was a massive preservation and burial of organic matter. By some estimates, 55% of organic matter fixed in the surface ocean was buried, compared to less than 1-2% to today. And the chemocline just got stronger, at least initially, due to the buildup of free oxygen in the atmosphere, thanks to the burial of all that organic matter. Now there are, perhaps, other unexpected consequences of the development of a strong chemocline. The rapid rise, for example, in atmospheric oxygen efficiently destroyed methane, a powerful greenhouse gas. The lag, uh, loss of the greenhouse effect made by the methane caused temperatures on Earth to plummet, 
an estimated 4 to 9 degrees centigrade, according to some models, bringing on glaciation. The increased weathering of silicate rocks, thanks to all that free oxygen, also helped to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide, another greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, and that also helped to refrigerate the planet. Hence, biological evolution of eukaryotes and the chemocline dumped Earth into the first snowball Earth climate catastrophe. The Earth froze over for a bit, a condition we'll discuss later in the class. Finally, note that in the Phanerozoic, that is the last 500 million years, when the ocean became completely oxic, molybdenum and sulfate became abundant in seawater, and iron and phosphorus both became micronutrients. Molybdenum is abundant because the molybdenum oxides are soluble in seawater, and so they remain there until used by organisms. Um, sulfate is also abundant because it's produced by the weathering of sulfides, like pyrite, uh, and does not form insoluble compounds until combined with various metals uh, under anoxic conditions. So a fully oxic ocean has lots of sulfate in it. Iron and phosphorus are rare because the ocean is fully oxic, and both elements are insoluble when oxidized. So the bottom line is that ocean nutrients change a lot as a function of oxygenation of the atmosphere. The anoxic ocean of the Archean um, gave way to an oxic ocean of the early Proterozoic, or at least partly one, and there is this massive burial of organic matter made by plankton in the upper ocean, a process that causes a rapid increase in atmospheric oxygen levels. Various people refer to this oxygen revolution as the Great Oxygenation Event, or GOE. Later, as the deep ocean becomes oxic, carbon burial slows and nutrients become scarce, perhaps contributing to the long, dull period in the carbon isotope record of the Mesoproterozoic. Um, some people have called this the boring billion because apparently nothing really goes on that time. All this stuff is triggered by life, from the production of free oxygen by cyanobacteria to the massive increase in the rate at which organic matter is exported from the surface ocean and the chemocline by eukaryotes. The oxygen revolution sped up weathering rates, changed ocean chemistry, and set in motion a massive glaciation that froze the planet over. Pretty dramatic stuff for single-celled algae.